All right, the kingdom parables. This is lesson number four in the series. The title of this lesson, the parable of the bridesmaid, and also we'll be doing the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. So we're doing a series studying the parables that Jesus gave describing the kingdom of heaven. And I said that understanding the nature of the kingdom of heaven is like putting a puzzle together. Uh, each parable provides us with a new piece or pieces of the puzzle that helps us see a more complete picture. So you'll notice that in the series that I'm doing, we talk about the, the, the parable itself, what it means, we get a couple of these pieces, I put them together, and then you know, I, 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 I repeat what we've learned so far so that we can continue to expand the uh, image and our understanding. So here are the pieces that our background study and review of several parables have given us so far. First of all, we've understood that the kingdom is a dimension where God rules with His servants. It is not a geopolitical type of kingdom. We've also learned that the kingdom exists in two dimensions at the moment. One kingdom, two dimensions. It is in heaven where God rules with His angels and the martyred saints, and it exists here on earth where God rules with the saints in the church. Okay. Another piece of the puzzle, at the end of the world, when Christ returns, these two dimensions will merge and both parts will become one. So if we're wondering what's going to happen at the end of the world, well that's what's going to happen. The kingdom of heaven in heaven and the kingdom of heaven on earth will merge to become one. And then we also learned that the parables describe the state of the kingdom here on earth and its development until it is fully formed and ready to be integrated with the kingdom in heaven. So we need to remember that you know, these parables are explaining how the kingdom is developing and the goal of its development. So far, we've learned that the kingdom on earth here affects the world by its presence. The kingdom of heaven on earth also is inhabited by all kinds of people, both sincere and insincere. That's always a kind of a shocker when we learn that, that the Bible says, oh, there, there are people, you know, if you say, wow, there are a lot of hypocrites in the church, that's not something new and that's not something God you know, didn't plan for. He talked about it in the parables. We learn that the kingdom will be purified before being joined with the kingdom above. We've also learned that the kingdom is open to all, but not all accept the invitation to enter in. You know, many are called, right? And those who enter in need to enter on God's conditions, not man's conditions. Okay, so today we're going to add a few uh, other pieces to the puzzle as we study other parables based on the kingdom. So we start with the parable of the bridesmaids. Now the parable of the bridesmaids or foolish virgins, depends on your translation there, and the one that follows it, the parable of the talents, are both looking forward to the time when the kingdom on earth will end and before joining the kingdom of, of, uh, the kingdom of heaven in heaven, before you know, that union, there will be a reckoning, there will be a sorting out a weeding out. Now this idea has already been spoken of you know, in the parable of the fish, right? The dragnet. It's repeated again here in both of these parables. Each point to this time, but they have a different thing to teach us about life in the kingdom and the reckoning that will come at that time. So we start with the parable of the bridesmaids and we will simply read that parable. Matthew 25, beginning in verse one, it says, then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the prudent took oil in flasks along with their lamps. Now, while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. 
But at midnight there was a shout, Behold, the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, No, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast, and the door was shut. Later the other virgins also came, saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. So there's the parable of the, uh, the foolish virgins or the, the bridesmaids. So let's, let's look at the story, shall we? You know, we always say we look at the story and then we look at the story behind the story. So let's look at the, the story. There were, there were three stages for a Jewish marriage or a Jewish wedding. First was the engagement stage when the families agreed on the marriage and a formal arrangement was arrived at by the fathers of the couple. Next, the betrothal stage. Um, a ceremony was held in the house of the bride's parents where mutual promises were made by each party and, very importantly, gifts were uh, given by the groom to the, future, um, to the future wife. A dowry, if you wish, was paid at this time. Now betrothal was a, you know, it was a serious commitment uh, in that if the man died, for example, before the wedding you know, could happen, the woman would be considered a widow. Even though they hadn't lived together, even though they hadn't, as they say, consummated uh, their relationship. Also, breaking a betrothal was equal to divorce. We know that because Joseph, right? Mary was betrothed to Joseph and when he thought of divorcing her, I mean of, of breaking their betrothal, uh, he, you know, they used the term divorce because he had to get a certificate of divorce, if you wish, or a bill of divorcement to break off the betrothal. And then, of course, there was the marriage. After about a year, the marriage took place at a feast held usually in the groom's house or a place of choosing. Usually the bridegroom, surrounded by his friends, went after sunset to get the bride at her home. And then the bride, of course, dressed in her best, would sometimes be carried in a basket, a large basket, with friends and family around, as a long procession carrying lamps and torches would light the way to the bridegroom's home for the wedding feast. Once the feast was over, the guests would leave and then the couple would remain in their new home. And that was a kind of a, you know, the, the, the type of thing they did at that time um, insofar as marriage is concerned. Now Jesus describes some young girls who will be part of the procession and as part of it they're going to light the way and ultimately go into the groom's house to celebrate the wedding because it, it was a parade. It was a happy parade. Family, friends, they lit up, they had torches, they had music, they played, they danced, they carried the bride. You know, that's, that's, that was a typical scene. Again, Jesus uses typical imagery that would have been understood by the people of that time. So in the story, there's a delay in the bridegroom's coming. All of the girls fall asleep, but then an advanced person alerts them that the procession is heading their way. Some of the maids did not bring enough oil to restart their lamps or torches for the final joyful procession. And as we see in the story, they try to borrow from the others but are refused, so they go out and try to find some at the last minute. The other maids are brought along to the feast and when all who are present, the party, the family, the guests, those who have joined the procession, the door is closed. Why? They don't want anybody to crash the wedding. There were wedding crashers even in those days. So the door is closed. Now the other maids arrive later, the maids arrive later. They're not only denied entry, but they're not even recognized by the groom. So that's the story. Again, fairly straightforward. People of that time would have understood a situation like this. Probably even some of them may have experienced something like that. So now the story behind the story. Before this parable, Jesus has prophesied about the end of Jerusalem, right? Matthew, we're in, we're in that section of Matthew. Now he goes ahead to speak a parable not only about the end of the Jewish nation and religion as it had existed. 
He also speaks to the believers about the end of the world when He will return. Now remember that parables were for those that were in the kingdom. So this is a warning and teaching for those who are in the kingdom, not unbelievers. Basically, he's saying to them that if they are in the kingdom, there are things that they need to watch out for. For example, there will be an end to the kingdom as it now exists on earth. The Jewish nation's end was destruction by Rome and persecution. The end of the kingdom on earth will be assimilation. In other words, a marriage between the bride, which is the church, and the groom, which is the Lord, when He comes. And so the marriage feast, the wedding feast, is imagery right, that is reflecting the wedding feast, if you wish, or the union that will take place at the end of the world when the church on earth is joined to the kingdom in heaven, right? And the Lord, who is the Lord of the kingdom of heaven and the Lord of the kingdom on earth, and these two will be joined together. So this is what this parable is pointing to. Another point, the end will come suddenly, right? It says a person comes suddenly and says, oh, the bridegroom has arrived, no time to waste, no time to go out. What, what is that signifying? Well, we, we know who we are waiting for and what will happen when he returns, but we don't know when. That's the, that's the thing. And that, you know, <laughs> that, that process is not anything new. The prophets were like that. They would talk about things that would happen in the future and they'd give the order of the things that would happen in the future, but what didn't they know or tell us? Well, the time. You know, Daniel talks about you know, different kingdoms that will arise and fall and rise and fall and, you know, and, and he gets them all in the correct order, doesn't he? What don't we know? Well, the amount of time between those kingdoms. And when that final kingdom will come, you know, he didn't know. And just reading the prophecy by itself, you couldn't tell. You only knew after it happened, you know, when Jesus finally, finally came to establish what? The kingdom of God here on, here on earth. Another point about the story behind the story. Everyone in the kingdom will be responsible for themselves. That is a key idea of this parable. We are in the kingdom because of God's grace, but this grace is not transferable. You know, uh, just a simple example of this, I, I know people, I know people in the church who think that because their brother is a faithful gospel preacher, that they themselves, who never darkened the door of the building, or serve the Lord in any way are going to come in on his coattails. Right? Haven't you kind of heard that from people? Well, well you know, my, my uncle's an elder, my grandfather was an elder, and I'm an elder, you know, or not I'm an elder, but you know, my brother's an elder, and so you know, our, our people are all church people. And what that person a lot of times is not saying, except me. Because our family you know, probably paid their dues, I probably can get in on their grace. Here's the interesting thing. That is a phenomenon that takes place no matter what church group you're with. When I was a Catholic, when I you know, grew up in the Catholic church, it was the same idea. You know? <laughs> if your uncle was a priest, you know, you're good. How, how can you not make it if your uncle's a priest? Or if one of your sons becomes a priest or a nun, are you kidding me? So that idea about the transfer of grace, the whole idea of infant baptism is all about the transfer of grace. You know, parents transferring their belief to the baby. And for that reason, that baby can then be baptized. You know, that's, that's, you know, I understand the, symp the sympathetic side of that, very sympathetic, very uh, appealing, if you wish, but not biblical. There's no, absolutely no biblical support for that. So you cannot be saved or restored from unfaithfulness by my grace. You must be saved and restored by God when He calls on you. At the end, there'll be no time to make things right or to restore oneself to faithfulness. Once the groom returns, 
there'll be no more opportunity or access to the grace. It'll be too late to say I'm sorry, too late for excuses. I know that in the movies and sometimes personal testimonies people like to talk about deathbed conversions and perhaps you know, in my own experience I've, I've seen not many. My experience and perhaps some of you guys who've, who have been preaching for a while, my experience have been if you've been unfaithful and if you've been worldly your whole life that's pretty much how you're going to die. You can't turn that stuff around on a dime. You know? Because what happens is you, you allow your heart to become so stone hard because it never practices its faith, it's never open to God for grace, it never humbles itself you know, throughout life, that it's, it's as hard as stone at the end. It can't repent, because it doesn't know how to repent anymore. So this foolish idea that, yeah, I'll turn it all around at the end, nah, no. You know, if you never learned how to skate on ice you know, when you were a kid, you're not going to learn when you're 75. Believe me on that one. <laughs> Another lesson, once the union is made, it's permanent. Judgment will not be a time for discussion or appeals because those who truly belong to Christ will be with Him and those who do not belong will be apart from Him and the line will, be, will not be crossed. I mean, obviously that's a harsh teaching and it's hard to, you know, to, to, to absorb that idea, the finality of it all. But the other side of it, it's comforting. If you're in Christ and with Christ, nothing will separate you from Him either. You don't have to be afraid. So the parable of the bridesmaids is an encouragement to those in the kingdom to be patient while they wait for the Lord. And for others who are in the kingdom also, but are running out of oil, and what are they, what's that running out of oil thing? Well, running out of faithfulness, running out of grace, running out of the desire to serve the Lord, running out of you know, self-control, running out of the spiritual uh, gifts and graces that we receive from God, running out of that, it's a warning to them to be careful not to lose these things because of neglect or unfaithfulness, laziness, sin, whatever, to be careful that they not be caught dry when He comes. And anyone who reads the Bible, especially the, the parables, can't miss that particular uh, lesson. You know, there are things that are hard to understand in the Bible. You know, who is the man of lawlessness? Well, you know, a lot of opinions about that. You know what I'm saying? And some of the imagery in the, uh, in the book of Revelation. Anyone who says, oh, the Bible's easy, you just have to read it. No, nah, it's not that easy. There, there are some parts that are difficult, but not this. This is not difficult to understand. Pretty straightforward. Okay, so that's the first parable. The second parable is the parable of the talents. And that's just, it just continues, Matthew 25, beginning in verse 14 this time, Jesus continues. He says, for it is just like a man, when he says for it is, meaning the kingdom, for it is just like a man about to go on a journey who, is called, uh, who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability, and he went on his journey. Immediately the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and gained five more talents. In the same manner the one who had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now after a long time the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. Also, the one who had received the two talents came up and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. 
But his master answered and said to him, you wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore, take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has the 10 talents. For to everyone who has more shall be given and he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. Throw out the worthless slave into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the story, again, very straightforward, uh, easily understood, actually by any culture, it doesn't have to be the Jewish culture, any culture, any generation, a wealthy master entrusts a sizable fortune to his slaves to trade and manage while he goes away for a long time on some undiscovered journey, uh, undisclosed uh, journey. Now a talent was not an, a, a, specific, uh, you know, a specific thing, it wasn't like a coin, or, or it, was, it was more like a, a measure or a weight of money. All right? uh, sometimes the talent consisted of minted coins or bars of gold or bars of silver. Uh, so we uh, find out that each receives a different amount based on the perceived skills that the master believes that they have. The one that gets 10, he gets 10 because the master considers, well, this guy's pretty sharp, you know, he's got experience, you know, I can trust him with a larger amount. The one with five and the one with one, the same idea. The point here is that each has enough to do something to make a profit with. After a long absence, the master returns to settle accounts and the first two servants double the master's money. Different sums, but same success. As a result, they're each rewarded with a larger scope of responsibility. Isn't that interesting? They get more responsibility. They get a promotion. That's, that's, their, that's their reward. And a closer relationship with their master, which is also a reward. They're more trusted, and because they're more trusted, they have a more intimate relationship with the master, another reward. For a slave, this was a great privilege. Now, the third servant, who had received the one talent, hid it in the ground. This was the least amount of risk. He wouldn't lose it in the market. Nobody would steal it. There'd be no depreciation. It was, as we say, the path of least resistance. When confronted by the master to explain why he did this, note the other two, you know, note the other two, when they came up, they just showed results. They didn't explain. They had results, not excuses. But this fellow here, he blames the master. He did what he did because the master was hard and unfair, so he didn't want to risk losing the talent or getting the master angry. So the master denounces him as wicked. Why? because he blames his evil on the good master. That's why he's wicked. Not because he didn't make any money. That's not why he's wicked. He's wicked because he blames the master for his own evil. And he calls him lazy. Why? Because this is why he didn't do anything. He's too lazy. He also tells him that if it was true that he was hard and unfair, then what he should have done was put it in a place that was both safe and slightly profitable, like a bank. I wonder if they were paying point <laughs> <laughs> 0.05 interest uh, like they do today. But even that would have been better than what he did, right? This, of course, would have required thought and effort. That's something lazy people hate to do, right? So the surprise comes when he gives the talent, you know, the lazy guy's talent, to the one who was the most successful to use. And the lazy slave is cast out to be punished severely. So that's the story. Now the story behind the story. This parable, like the one of the bridesmaids, refers to people who are in the kingdom. And it also you know, talks about the return of Jesus. However, this is where the similarity between the two parables uh, changes, or ends rather. In the parable of the talents, the Lord is teaching that everyone in the kingdom has received a measure of blessing of some kind that is to be used for God's profit, or to be used for God's glory, or to expand the kingdom, you know, any way you want to, to say that. 
Now, there are a variety of blessings. You know, it's not just the blessing of, like when they talk about uh, you can be a teacher or a deacon, you know, those are blessings, of course, but people receive all kinds of blessings, don't they? Good health. You ask anybody that has had to struggle with poor health their whole life, what a burden that can be. And not just a burden for you know, personal you know, energy, I mean a burden on their career, a burden on their, uh, you know, on their, on their uh, family. You know, what about a mom who has three beautiful, lovely children, but she herself suffers from excruciating migraines? You know? That nothing can take care of, she just has to, well, whatever joy there is of having and raising children is gone you know, when, you're, when you can't function because you've got a headache. So having good health. You know, an interesting side note, you know, I, I read some biographies about you know, famous people, great people, presidents and other type of people. You know, and one of the things I noticed about these people, both men and women, somehow they have been given the ability to get by on like four hours of sleep. Winston Churchill, they just mentioned this about Mr. Trump. Forget about politics, I, I don't, good or bad here. The point that they made about him is this, this person, he's 70 years old, doesn't get, he gets four or five hours of sleep per night, period. He's ready to go. And I noticed that a lot of people who have achieved great things have this tremendous you know, energy and ability, physical energy to be up you know, 18 to 20 hours a day doing their thing, while the rest of us need our eight hours, some nine. Anyways, we won't go there. <laughs> so my point is that you have good health. That's a gift, that you have tremendous energy or physical strength, intelligence, charisma, leadership ability, you're born you know, into a rich household where you have advantages of education. That's a great gift from God. You've got money or certain talents. You know, not everybody can throw a ball at, at 105 miles an hour. And some people have taken that skill and what they've done is made a lot of money and then wasted their life on drugs and all kinds of uh, foolish living. And others have taken that simple skill, I'm able to throw a ball at 105 miles an hour and have built a great life for themselves and their family. You know what I'm saying? Everybody gets some kind of gift. Spiritual gifts, of course. Opportunities, beauty. You know, I mean, let's face it, uh, how many, how many uh, 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 surveys and research papers have said that people who are, quote, handsome, you know, women are, are beautiful, men are handsome, so get more opportunities. It's not fair, right? It's not fair. It's not your fault. You know, you're, you're, you're a grown man and you're five foot, five foot. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You go for a job, you have the same skills as the guy who's six foot, you know, but somehow, statistically, that six foot guy usually gets the job you know, gets advanced, it's not fair, it is what it is, it's a gift. So everybody gets a variety of blessings. The parable teaches that when Jesus returns, each one will be held accountable for what they have done with their gifts. Beethoven, Mozart, two geniuses, two gifted people, the gift they had with music, you couldn't learn. I mean, you know, as a, as, a, as a child, Mozart was writing classical music as a child. The difference, yeah, Mozart dissipated life. Beethoven, the beginning of every you know, sheet of music, he would write in the margin, to God be the glory. So you see what I'm saying? Different people, different gifts, different results. Different results. And everyone will be accountable for those. Unlike the parable of the bridesmaids, this story focuses in on the reckoning that will come for those who are within the kingdom. The first one, the first parable says, you got to be ready, you don't know what's going to happen. There's going to be a reckoning. The second one says, you better be ready for the reckoning because you're going to be held accountable for what you've received. Now we know that those who reject Christ 
never confess his name are condemned, right? Mark 16, 16. You know, those who believe and are baptized will be saved. Those who disbelieve will be condemned. But in these parables, Jesus wants to show how we will we, or, or how he will weed out those uh, who have confessed his name and associated with the kingdom, but are not going to be allowed to remain in it when he returns. That's the difference. So concerning his return and the reckoning with the kingdom itself, this parable teaches us several other things. Number one, God will look for results, not excuses. You know, we've been saved to serve. We've been saved to bear fruit. We've been saved to confess and follow Christ and when He returns, it'll be obvious to Him who has and who has not been profitable. Very so, you know, the parables, you know, they sound quaint. Even people, when they see the title of this, oh, the parables, those are fun, you know? except when you really begin to look at them, you realize, man, that's, they're pretty sobering. They kind of bring you up short. Secondly, everyone has different talents, but we all have the same responsibility. When he returns, it'll be obvious who has invested it in the world, who has invested it in themselves, who has buried it through neglect, and who has made a spiritual profit. In the Bible, it's very rare that the the writers of the Bible describe the appearance of people. Very rare you get. Uh, they mention Esther, for example, that she was a, a beautiful woman. But it's very rare that they, you know, the Bible writers describe if a man or a woman is beautiful or not, but they describe that she was a beautiful woman. The idea being that was her gift. It didn't say she was a very intelligent woman or she was very skilled or strong. It just says she was she was beautiful, and because of her beauty, what happened to her? Well, that gift that she received enabled her to be in a position where she could actually save her people. And yet we see sometimes people, men, women, who have received the gift of beauty, right? And what do they do with it? They trade it in for money or fame or worldliness or other things like that. I'm, I'm saddened when I see actresses or movie star, whatever, you know what I mean, who have been given talents and gifts by God. Throw them away and waste them and actually use them in, in such a way as to insult God. Terrible, terrible thing. And we each have this responsibility. We're not going to be able to blame somebody else for our failure to bear fruit in the kingdom. All the resources to do, you know, to do what we have to do are there. And all of us here, all of us, we have the Holy Spirit within us. We have the Word before us. We have the church around us. So we have the spiritual resources, all of us, equally whether we're younger or older, whether we're experienced or less experienced, all of us have the Spirit, all of us have the Word, all of us have the church. All of us are responsible for doing something with those gifts that God has given us. Another point at Jesus' return, some will rejoice and some will weep. Like the parable of the bridesmaids, the prepared ones went into the feast and the unprepared ones were left out. Isn't it interesting to note that the, 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 the bridesmaids that didn't go in, it didn't say they were bad people. They didn't get drunk or something you know, and, and, and pass out, or they, they weren't cavorting. They, they wanted to go to the feast. And they would have gone to the feast. They wouldn't have been locked out for any reason. But they weren't prepared. They didn't think it through. And so there, it's not just people like Hitler you know, and Castro, we shouldn't judge, you know, but uh, let's put it this way. <laughs> Their deeds 
<laughs> their deeds have gone before to the Lord. You know, when the Bible said some people, their deeds go before them and others, they come after them. You know. Mr. Castro and, and Mr. Hitler, you know, their deeds are quite obvious in front of all of us and they have gone before them uh, to the Lord for judgment. So it's uh, fairly safe to say that uh, what they have done is not what God have, has wanted them to do. But these characters here, they're, they're not bad people. And so it's not all bad people, it's not all monsters you know, that will lose the opportunity to be in the kingdom. Sometimes people do it just because of carelessness, foolishness. So some will rejoice and some will weep. In this parable, the fruitful ones are allowed to stay with the master and rejoice in his presence and are given the responsibility. Paul says that when Jesus comes, the church will judge angels and sit at the right hand of God ruling with him. Wow, I wonder what that's going to be like. 1 Corinthians 6.3 and 2 Timothy 2.11. This is a pretty big responsibility in joy, bigger than what we have now. I'm intrigued by the idea that we will have, quote, responsibility in heaven, that it isn't <laughs> the Bible doesn't describe it as a, a passive thing, that you, you'll do nothing. You'll be doing something, just we're not sure what exactly. On the other hand, those who are unfruitful will no longer be able to remain in the presence of the Lord. The unbelievers, of course, they're never in the presence of the Lord. However, disobedient, lazy, sinful Christians, they are for a while in the presence of the Lord by virtue of the fact that they're in the church. Jesus says that this will end when He returns and the alternative will be suffering and regret, that idea of gnashing of teeth. And so uh, Jesus reinforces the warning to disciples in the kingdom that before the kingdom on earth is brought up to be with the kingdom in heaven, there will be a reckoning. And Christians need to be two things. They need to be ready and they need to be faithful. I make one argument you know, for the, the idea of, um, you know, some people say, why do we have Wednesday church? You know, are you going to go to heaven you know, if you don't go to Wednesday church? How about it? You're not going to make it if you don't go to Sunday night church? You know? And right away, when just that question alone says, OK, <laughs> your issue is not about going to church. <laughs> your issue is about maturity. <laughs> But do we, quote, have to? Well, of course not. There's nothing written in the Bible about that. We know that. But those things are there to help us what? To stay ready. To, to help us keep you know, sharp, to stay sharp. I remember, uh, I think a long time ago, I wrote an article about icebergs. Uh, or, uh, excuse me, uh, what do they call those? The ships that go in the... Icebreakers, that's it. Icebreakers up in Canada along the, uh, the St. Lawrence Seaway, where all the ships come in there, they have icebreakers going up and down, breaking up that ice all the time to keep the ships flowing. And I compared the idea of coming to church on Wednesday and Sunday night and you know, the various activities we have, the icebreakers. Because what happens, we spend most of our time in the world because we have to, we have to work and do that. And somehow that builds a, a kind of a coating of worldliness on us, like ice. And Wednesday church, Sunday night church, you know, regular attendance, those type of things, tends to break that up and not allow it to coalesce over us so that we, we start to be hard and insensitive to spiritual things. And so continually hearing the word being preached to us and continually you know, facing other believers and sharing with them helps us to stay malleable and to keep our spirit you know, uh, um, able to receive spiritual ideas and spiritual messages from God's word and from God's uh, spirit. So we have to be ready and have to be fruitful. Okay, so that's our, uh, that's our class for today. We'll uh, continue this series next time. Thank you very much.